you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Psalm 132. I have to warn you, this is going to be the shortest Sunday service. This morning after our 8.30 service, I looked at my clock uh, and, and, and the big, big hand was at 45. So I was a little confused. Is it 10.45 or is it 9.45? I had to look at it again. I was like, oh, it's only 9.45. Service is over. You know? uh, usually service gets over at 10 o'clock and we were like 15 minutes ahead of time. So you'll be happy. Psalm 132. Verses 13 to 18. Psalm 132, verses 13 to 18. We're just going to take some time to meditate in these verses, and that's all, and then we'll close after that. Verse 13. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation. And her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame. But upon himself his crown shall flourish. Been reading through the Psalms like many of us would. And uh, just spend some time sitting on these verses and just be so blessed just reading these verses. So I just want to share that with you. And that's the sermon. <laughs> right? For the Lord, verse 13, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it. He has desired it for his dwelling. Verse 14, this is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. What caught my attention here was God saying, I have desired. God is saying, I want this. I desire to make Zion my dwelling place, a my resting place, a place where I dwell, where my presence dwells, remains. It says, I have desired something God desires. I have desired it. Wow. God has desires. Amen. And He desires to dwell, to have a resting place. And he says, I have chosen. I have chosen. Nobody, it wasn't like an open bid system, you know. Everybody putting in a bid. And let's see who wins. I have chosen. God says, I've gone after this. I have chosen. Zion. To be my dwelling place. A place where my presence would abide and remain. Now Zion, what is Zion? It's very interesting to follow through in the Bible and understand what Zion is. Zion, geographically or originally, was just a little mount outside of Jerusalem. You read about this in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7. It was just a little mountain outside, mount outside of Jerusalem, a small hill. And... Uh, it was inhabited by a tribe called the Jebusites. And they had set up their own city on Mount Zion. Built a little fort around it like how they used to have it in those old days. They used to fortify their cities. And so the Jebusites lived on that mountain. A mount. In their own fortress. Now when David became king over Jerusalem. 
he went and he attacked and he conquered and he took over Mount Zion, this city that was on the mount. And it was called, it then changed the name. It became the city of David. The city of David. So Mount Zion came to be known as the city of David. And as Jerusalem continued to expand, the name Zion or the city of David or Jerusalem enveloped this whole area, everything. Mount Zion, Jerusalem, city of David, all interchangeable, referring to the same place. So that's the geography of it. Mount Zion, the city of Jerusalem. And as you read the Bible, you'll find slowly that the city of Jerusalem began to be called the city of the Lord. The city of the great king. And Mount Zion, as you begin to progress through the Bible, became a term no longer to refer to just the geogra geography or the geography of the place, the term Mount Zion now began to be used of, of the people of God, the people of Israel. So when the Bible talked about Zion, it's talking about the people of Israel, the people of God. So it went from being a little, the name of a little mount that the Jebusites inhabited to becoming the city of David, to becoming the city of Jerusalem, to becoming the name given to the people of God. So in the Bible, when you read about Mount Zion or Zion, is referring to the people of God. And it didn't stop there. As you move into the New Testament, it continues. And you find out that the term Zion is used for the church. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, Peter says, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And then he quotes in the next verse from Isaiah 28, 16. He says, I lay in Zion a foundation stone, a sure foundation. So, Jesus Christ is the foundation stone of Zion, the church. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 23, the Bible tells us believers, you believers, you have come to Mount Zion. It's like, what do you mean? We're all going on a pilgrimage to Mount Zion? No, 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 no. no. You have come to Mount Zion. What is Mount Zion? He continues. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Meaning you've come to the church. This is Mount Zion. The church of Jesus is Mount Zion. Amen. So in the Bible, when the Bible uses the word Zion or Mount Zion, in the Old Testament you understand it as the people of Israel, the people of God. In the New Testament you understand it as a church. The church of Jesus, the church of the living God. And what we understand in scripture is that many things that are spoken of, the, uh, the people of God in Israel, of Zion in the old, apply in the spiritual sense to Zion in the new. Am I confusing you all? You all with me so far? Very simple. All right? So let's read these verses again with that perspective. The Lord has chosen Zion. Now we are Zion in the New Testament. The Lord has chosen the church. He's chosen us. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell for I have desired it. The church, the people of God, we are to be the dwelling place. Of God. Amen. We are to be the place. Where God says. I will dwell among them. I will rest among them. My presence will be among them. We are to be known as a people. Among whom God dwells. Amen. Wouldn't that be so great. They don't call us all people's church. They call us people among whom God dwells. Amen? Yeah, yeah, those people there. You know, those people, do they speak in tongues. They do all these crazy things. But God is among them. 
Amen? That's what we're supposed to be known for. That God says, I have chosen Zion. I've chosen the church. I've chosen these people that I have desired to dwell among them. God desires to dwell, to let his abiding presence rest upon us. Now, I'm not talking about us as individuals. As individuals, all of us are the temple of the living God. We've got the Holy Spirit living in us. Uh, we, are, we, are, you know, we, we are carriers individually of the presence of God. But I'm talking about us as a community, as a body of believers, that God chooses to dwell among us corporately as a body. Amen? The local church is the expression, a physical expression of the spiritual church, the body of Christ. So, which means that we as a people are to be a people among whom God dwells, his dwelling place. Amen? Now, here is what we see happens when God dwells among us. When we become the dwelling place of God. When God has, is staying here is abiding here upon us as a people, as a community of believers, when he has made us his dwelling place, here is, here is what happens. Let's read the next few verses. Verse 15. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. So God says, when I'm dwelling up among them, and I make Zion my dwelling place, and I'm dwelling among these people, here's what I will do. I will abundantly bless her provision, and I will satisfy her poor, her, the needy, with bread. Meaning, divine provision begins to flow in this community, in this people among whom God dwells. Amen? You come in needy, I come in needy, I come in with my needs, things that are in areas of my life where, I, where only God could touch and meet. And I come in and I receive of the provision of God because God is dwelling here. Supernatural provision. Prosperity in our lives begin to flow. The needs of God's people begin to be met. And who does it? God says, I will. Look at the number of times in this passage that God says, I will. He says in verse 15, I will abundantly bless. I will satisfy a poor. Verse 16, I will. Verse 17, I will make the horn. I will prepare a lamp. I will clothe. Everything God is saying, I will do. Like we're not trying to bribe God into doing it. We're not trying to coerce him into doing this. He says, I will. I'll do it. It's my will for these people because I'm dwelling among them. Amen. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing that as a people, because God is dwelling among us, when people come in, they come in, we come in with all our needs, our wants, we begin to see, oh, my needs are being met. Provision is beginning to flow in my life. I came in needy, but now I'm having bread. What's happening? Well, you're among a people among whom God is dwelling. Amen. And God's doing it. He's saying, I will do it. He's just moving among the people and he's meeting needs. What else? Next verse. Verse 16. I will also clothe her priests with salvation. And her saints shall shout aloud. See, sometimes I'm more of a quiet person. But the Bible forces me to shout. You know, it says, her saints shall shout aloud. You know. With joy. The joy of salvation. They'll shout aloud. So verse 16, what happens? God says, I will begin to clothe my people with salvation. What is salvation? We know from the Bible 
Salvation includes forgiveness of sins. It includes healing for sicknesses. It includes deliverance from every demonic work, safety, preservation, wholeness. It is just a total reversal of what sin does in our lives. That's salvation. And God says, I will, I will, I will, I will clothe, I will clothe my people with salvation. And they will shout for joy. They will experience the joy of salvation. They'll shout. I mean, it'll overflow. Quiet people like me will begin to shout. Amen. The joy of salvation. We'll, you know, like everywhere we go, we'll see people getting healed. We'll see people being delivered. They come in with bondages. They get set free. They come in oppressed. They get delivered. Devils don't want to come among our midst because God is dwelling. So salvation happens so easily. Every work of, the, of darkness is just broken. It's just, I will clothe them with salvation. And my saints will shout aloud for joy. Why? Because we are a people among whom God's dwelling. Amen. Salvation just happens. Did you notice this morning we never preached the gospel? They just got saved. They just came. Huh? Just said Jesus is the Lamb of God. You want to get right? Something's happening. People just want to get saved. I want to get healed. I want to receive of this God who dwells among his people. Next verse. Verse 17. There, that is among these people whom I'm dwelling, there... I will, again, I will, God will do it. I will make the horn of David grow. It's long horn, you know. Guys, I'm just, I have to laugh at my own joke, you know. <laughs> Bad joke. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. He says, I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. Our David represents an anointed person, that's all. An anointed person. So God says, there in these people among whom I am dwelling, I will make the horn of my anointed ones, you and me, I will make the horn grow. What is horn? Horn symbolizes strength, dominion, our capacity to conquer and overcome. That's horn in the Old Testament. The king's horn. Didn't mean all the kings had long horns. It just means their strength, their capacity to triumph and conquer. So God says, there I will cause the horn of my anointed ones to increase. Meaning God increases our strength. God keeps on increasing our capacity to conquer, to overcome, to triumph. You think you've got victories now. Wait till he causes you to grow. It causes your horn to grow. causes your strength to grow. See the kinds of victories that come your way. He says, I will cause... Their horn to grow, their strength, their overcoming capacity, their ability to conquer, I will cause it to increase. Can you imagine having a church full of people who got long horns? I mean, it's growing. Meaning, their strength is increasing and increasing. Their capacity to have dominion over things around them. Their ability to conquer circumstances, triumph over the works of darkness. It's just increasing and increasing and increasing. And the pastor is not doing it. God is doing it. He says, I will cause their horn to grow. It's just causing you to increase. You keep overcoming. Keep conquering. Your strength keeps on increasing when we are a people among whom God dwells. And then he says, I will be a lamp to my anointed. Lamp represents revelation. You begin to see things you've never seen. You begin, begin to get insights about God and your revelation of who God is keeps on growing and growing and growing. You keep on discovering wonderful things about God. Amen? So you can never get to know God, comprehend God completely. He is infinite. And so the revelation that he can give to us of himself is limitless. Amen? 
And when we are a people among whom God is dwelling, he says, there, I will cause the horn of my anointed ones, their strength, their dominion, their ability to conquer. I will keep on increasing it, and I will be their lamp. I will be their revelation. I will keep on giving them revelation, more and more understanding who I am, and, and just keep just, just being absorbed in God. Amen? Last verse. I told you it's going to be a short sermon. Verse 18. His enemies I will clothe with shame. But upon himself his crown will flourish. His enemies those who oppose you, those who come against you, every demonic assignment, every strategy of the devil, every scheme that he has against your life, God says, I will bring it all to shame. And instead, your crown, he says, I will cause to flourish. Your crown, meaning your honor, your glory will keep on increasing. Your honor will keep on increasing. Your glory Keep on increasing. It will flourish. And all things that oppose you, we put to shame. Get down, get down, get down. Amen. I like to sign up and be a part of this people among whom God dwells. Amen. And God says, I have chosen Zion. I have chosen the church. For me to dwell. And they will be these kind, this kind of people. They will have this happening among them. Amen. We as a local church are just an expression. A small expression. Part expression of that spiritual body. But we as a local church are entitled to what we read in the Bible. Because we are part of that spiritual church. Are you with me? That means we as a people, we can be this house. We can be a people among whom God dwells. And all of this God begins to do amongst us. He says, I will do it. I'll do it. And we just begin to experience this. Amen. Which now brings us to our responsibility. Of being Zion. That we. Be a people among whom God is pleased to dwell. Before you do something. Here's corporate responsibility. All of us have individual responsibilities. To take care of our own lives. And that's a must. But I also want you to think in terms of corporate responsibility. Before I do something, how is it going to impact the body that I'm part of? How is it going to impact the dwelling of God among us? Because I don't want to be the reason. God said, I'm not coming there. Amen? I'm not putting, saying this to condemn us or you know, to make us feel bad. I'm just saying, look. If we want to be this people among whom God is going to dwell, I think all of us must be responsible to make it happen. By saying, you know, what I do, how would it affect the dwelling place of God? How would it affect God just coming and resting upon us as a people? Because I want, all of us want, this house this church, this community of believers to be a dwelling place of God. And all these things just begin to flow amongst us. People come up with needs and God says, I will provide for them. People come with hearts and wounds and God becomes their salvation. People come in and, and they begin to see the increase of, of their begin overcoming capacity. They begin to conquer and triumph over adversaries. And, and they see victory and triumph coming into their lives. And, and they see revelation. They keep keep getting revelation from God and, and, and God begins to increase their honor and their glory on the earth and they're just being part of a body among whom God is dwelling. And it's all happening in their lives. Amen. 
I want to invite you and me as people to say, yes, God, we want to be such a people. God's looking for hungry people. You know, if we are indifferent to the presence of God, yeah, we have some nice songs. I go home, forget about it. It's not going to attract much of the presence of God. But if we are hungry, say, God, we want to be this people that we read about in the Bible. We want to be the dwelling place. We are hungry for that. He's going to come. Fill us. He's looking for a holy people. You know, 2 Corinthians 6, Paul quotes from the Old Testament. He says, come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and I will walk amongst them. I will dwell with them and they will be called my people. So, looking for holy people, looking for people. He's so looking for people of faith because faith attracts God. People just step out, believe God. Believe miraculous provisions. Believe in the supernatural coming through and bringing salvation. Believe people who step on have faith. God's looking for these people. And all of us have the opportunity to make it happen here. Amen.